heart of the Middle East, an assassin slips through a crowd, looking for an opening to strike. Amid boiling religious tensions, two dictators plot each other's downfall. A powerful bomb blast in the heart of Saddam Hussein's Iraq signals the point of no return. When your back is against the wall, a full-scale retaliation can appear as the only viable option. These are the secret plots that lead to the start of the Iran-Iraq War, the battle between two maniacal tyrants, the war that cost over a million lives. These are the events that shape our world. These are the leaders that risk it all. These are the final moments before war. This is Edge of War. Terrorism, holy war, chemical weapons, perhaps a million dead. The Iran-Iraq war is one of the longest and bloodiest wars of the 20th century. When conflicts like this explode into all-out war, it's generally due to long-standing grievances perceived to be unsolvable, a conflict over territory, a dispute about exactly where a border should be drawn, issues that democracies often try to resolve through negotiation. But when two dictators are involved, egos come into play. Grievances can get warped through the minds of strong and tractable personalities, each with his own grand ambitions. A dispute can become a fight to the death, and that often means the deaths of many. To see what a leader is truly capable of, you must look behind the scenes at how they treat their own people. In the summer of 1979, Saddam Hussein welcomes government officials and top members of his ruling Ba'ath Party to a conference in Baghdad, Iraq. Upon arrival, the men are forced to surrender their firearms. Exits are sealed, and a video camera is turned on. Vice President for the last 11 years, this is Saddam's first party meeting as president. Saddam Hussein was a man who was able to garner all this power. He was like a street thug, a mafioso, who projected to the entire world an aura of strength. With his audience now trapped, Saddam shocks them by announcing that he has uncovered a widespread plot against him and his rule. On stage appears a man who looked like he'd been through the ringer. The atmosphere is, feels staged, choreographed. He says to Saddam, I'm here to read off a list of traitors. One by one, the alleged traitors are hauled outside. Saddam Hussein loved theatrics. He loved the show and he would send out these men and he would shed crocodile tears after each one of them, just to give the impression that he had feelings for them, that he regretted what he was doing. The mood becomes extremely fearful. At that point, everyone begins to jump up. They begin to say, Saddam, you've done so many wonderful things for Iraq. You are our great new leader, and we profess total loyalty to you. To test and strengthen that loyalty, Saddam decides to seal it in blood, demanding the remaining officials help carry out the sentence. Saddam Hussein tells them, if you really want to show fealty and love and devotion towards me, take these traitors and just shoot them. This is being taped. The victim's hands are tied behind their backs, and they're shot in the head. Remember, there are their own comrades. And this is not part of any plot against Saddam Hussein. This is all a purge. This meeting was a form of political theater. It had nothing to do with a supposed uh, plot against Saddam. It was meant to send a chill throughout the country, to send a message to all the local Ba'ath Party leaders, because this was videotaped and sent to all of them, 
that anyone who tried to contravene Saddam's authority would be summarily executed. And of course, by forcing local Ba'ath Party leaders to actually participate in the firing squads, he made them complicit in his new style of rule. Saddam's path to power is completely lined in blood. Using his singular authority and his country's massive oil wealth, Saddam aggressively builds up the size and strength of the Iraqi armed forces. Saddam was fond of wearing military uniforms, even though he had never served in the military. He'd even given himself the title of general. Being leader of his military forces appeals to Saddam, but his ambition grows. More than anything, he craves his own place in history, the supreme commander of a bigger, more powerful Iraq and beyond. Deep down, Saddam wanted to become leader of a new pan-Arab nation. He wanted to control the entire Middle East. To realize this dream, Saddam needs to find a way to crush the biggest obstacle in his way, Iran, Iraq's historical enemy to the east. There is much bad blood between the two countries. Their biggest conflict? The Shat al Arab waterway, gateway to the Persian Gulf and a key shipping route for oil exports. Iraq controlled the waterway for decades, but in a 1975 treaty, a stronger Iran pressures Saddam to give up half of it, to divide it down the middle, a loss of territory that deeply offends Saddam. Well, Saddam was infuriated that he had to make these concessions. He was a very macho leader. He saw this as a threat to his manhood, and most of all, he felt humiliated in front of his countrymen. At the time, Saddam is in no position to fight back. Iran is ruled by a powerful leader with an ambition every bit as big as his own, a man named Reza Pahlavi, known around the world as the Shah. Using Iran's oil wealth, the Shah, with strong support from the United States, has developed the fifth largest army in the world and a state-of-the-art air force. The Shah had built up a large fleet of American-made fighters. Iraq was simply in no position to negotiate. Saddam bides his time, waiting for a moment of weakness. In the late 1970s, cracks appear in the Shah's once powerful regime. His reformist agenda creates unrest, and his people take to the streets. Protesters demand democracy, and Islamic religious leaders denounce the Western-style modernization the Shah brings to Iran. Back in Iraq, an Iranian cleric living in exile under Saddam's protection becomes a lightning rod for the opposition against the Shah. His name is Ayatollah Rohala Khomeini. Khomeini was a profoundly religious man. He lived an almost ascetic life. He opposed the Shah's plans for modernization uh, as something that is a Western design to undermine Islam. Khomeini records his inflammatory thoughts on audio cassettes and has them smuggled into Iran. Well, these little cassettes would run. Ayatollah Khomeini would talk about God and the place of Iran and the world. The Shah represented Western culture and values. Khomeini rejected it. It was an affront to his deeply religious principles. While the Shah embraced such things as movie theaters, uh, casinos, uh, discotheques, for Khomeini, this was abominable. This was completely unacceptable. The Shah was the very antithesis of all that Khomeini stood for. He called the Shah a boy. He called him a lackey of Zionism, of Israel, of the United States. Angered, the Shah demands Saddam Hussein silence the elderly cleric. This creates a dilemma for Saddam. An enemy of his enemy should be his friend. But Saddam has well-founded fears. Khomeini could stir up religious fervor against his own regime. Saddam makes a fateful decision expelling Khomeini from his sanctuary in Iraq. Khomeini was a man who never forgot those who had crossed him. He bore grudges all his life and made sure anybody who had done anything wrong to him would pay a heavy price and he certainly felt Saddam had done him wrong. Exiled from the region, 
Khomeini's influence back in Iran only grows stronger. Ayatollah Khomeini's appeal was more to the masses, the working classes, the peasants, and it was on primarily religious grounds. And for that reason alone, it was far greater than the appeal of the Shah. In early 1979, the Shah is forced to flee Iran, enabling Khomeini to return to his homeland, where he's greeted by millions. Khomeini sweeps away what's left of the Shah's government, and despite promising democracy, he declares a strict Islamic republic. He became an absolutist leader, and very soon in the constitution they developed, they gave him more power than the Shah ever had. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein hopes the fall of the Shah plays into his hands and helps him realize his territorial dreams. He quickly learns he's traded one enemy for another, this one more hostile than the last. One of the first things that Khomeini does when he comes to power is to denounce Saddam Hussein. He calls him a cutthroat, the brigand, the criminal, and it was the beginning of a war of words between them. There was great animosity between these two men. Saddam Hussein was secular and Sunni, whereas the Ayatollah Khomeini was a Shia and was a very deeply religious man. These were two men with very big egos and very different political visions for the Middle East. Saddam wanted to create a pan-Arab nation that would be under his control. Khomeini wanted to create a pan-Islamic state that would be under his and Iran's control. Eventually, there was bound to be a collision. Saddam wants his waterway back and to build a greater Iraq. The Ayatollah has his own sinister plans for the Iraqi dictator, plans he will soon make public. He doesn't just want to keep Saddam at bay. He wants his head, even if it means a bitter fight to the death. Dictators often control their citizens through force and fear, and with the help of powerful ideas and propaganda. Saddam Hussein spent years gaining full control in Iraq, often using the bloodiest of methods in his climb to the presidency. He also appealed to Arab nationalism. He wanted to go down in history as the leader of an Arab empire far larger than Iraq itself. But by the time he has finally vanquished all his rivals in government and built up a sizable army, he's suddenly face to face with a new kind of threat next door, the threat of a country in the throes of a revolution. When Ayatollah Khomeini takes over in Iran, he becomes a roadblock on Saddam's path to greatness. The new Iran is more hostile and more radical than the last. Whether revolutions are democratic, communist, or in the case of Iran, Islamic, they're often based on an ideology or worldview, one that the revolutionaries believe in and would be happy to see spread beyond their own borders. The expansionist outlook of these ideologies can raise tensions between nations, and the old alliance between the United States and the Shah of Iran, now dissolved, no longer restrains territorial ambitions. The Ayatollah's new hegemonic aims begin with the historic enemy next door, led by Saddam Hussein. In 1979, change grips the Middle East. For Saddam Hussein, the fall of the Shah in Iran is both a blessing and a threat. A weaker Iran might allow Saddam to dominate the region and start building his Arab empire. But Ayatollah Khomeini is even more hostile than the Shah, and he has inherited the Shah's powerful army. The Ayatollah has another powerful weapon too, religion, which he quickly makes the law of the land. Despite his outwardly peaceful demeanor, Khomeini proves just as ruthless as Saddam. He creates a revolutionary court to cleanse the country of evil influences. Former officials from the Shah's regime, or those accused of being a threat to the new religious path of Iran, get a swift taste of Khomeini's revolutionary justice. There was no lawyers, there was no appeal, there was no jury. The trial sometimes lasted no more than a few minutes, and the first of them were conducted in the house where Khomeini resided. They were taken upstairs into the rooftop and turned over to a firing squad. There are reliable reports that Khomeini himself 
walked up the first steps and watched the first of what became many, many executions. Within the weeks that followed, literally hundreds were sent to the firing squad. And when someone finally did dare ask him whether he was worried that innocent people might be killed, he said, I'm not worried. If these people are guilty, we are helping them by shortening their sinful lives. If they're innocent, you're also helping them because if you're martyred by the court of the Islamic government, you will be directly sent to heaven. He showed that he had absolutely no compunction about sending some of his closest aides to the fire. He was a man of no pity, no remorse. The best known figure in Khomeini's grasp is the Shah's former prime minister, Amir Abbas Haveda. There was a great deal of sympathy for him, an outpouring of sympathy for him. He was well regarded. And now his fate was hanging in the balance. There was an international effort, as well as uh, an effort inside the government of Iran to keep Hoveda alive and put him on trial. Khomeini promised to uh, abide by their wishes and then double-cross them. He was found guilty, ordered death. They gave the gun to a cleric whose father was killed in prison under the Shah. He wanted to have him die most painfully, gave him a bullet in the neck, another one in the chest. The Hovindar then begged somebody to finish him off, and a, a, a guard abides and gives him the coup de grace. The execution shows the world the uncompromising zeal of Khomeini's revolution, a religious radicalism that also targets the United States, Iran's longtime ally under the rule of the Shah. In November of 1979, Iranian students overrun the American embassy in Tehran, taking 52 embassy staffers hostage. The captured Americans are bound and blindfolded. For their release, Iran demands the United States send the Shah, receiving medical attention in the U.S., back to face Khomeini's revolutionary courts. The United States refuses. The hostage crisis shocks the American public and President Jimmy Carter. With neither side willing to give in, it drives a deep wedge between the two countries. Across the border in Iraq, Saddam Hussein watches the hostage crisis closely. His old enemy Iran has isolated itself and cut all ties with the West. So much so, he believes the United States may even welcome a stronger Saddam Hussein. But the Iraqi dictator finds himself in the crosshairs of Khomeini's greatest weapon, religion, something Saddam is in dangerously short supply of. We often see Saddam Hussein kneeling, paying lip service to Islam, when in reality, he was very secular. He didn't care very much. Not only is Saddam seen as non-religious, his ruling party is mostly made up of Sunni Muslims, concentrated in northern Iraq. Most Iraqis are Shia Muslims, as are the Iranians next door, a division Ayatollah Khomeini wastes little time exploiting. In a bold move, Khomeini calls on Iraqis to rise up in revolution against Saddam and overthrow him, to create an Islamic state just like in Iran. Even worse, the calls for revolution are quickly echoed inside Iraq itself by a respected cleric named Bakr el Sadr, head of the Dawa Party, a religious organization and a longtime thorn in Saddam's side. Ayatollah Bakr el Sadr is a highly respected Shiite cleric in Iraq. The Iraqi Shia love him, and he's respected by all Iraqis. His writings are very moderate, but in the end, he comes to agree with Khomeini that Saddam has to be overthrown. Attacking head-on, al-Sadr and his Dawa party brazenly issue a religious fatwa against Saddam and his ruling Ba'athist party. Uh, the fatwa, the decree or edict, was calling upon the destruction of the Saddam regime. Saddam knows all too well if Khomeini's revolution spreads to his own country, 
he could easily go the way of the Shah. It called upon the people to rise against Saddam, calling Saddam a cutthroat, a brigand, a tyrant, a torturer, and of course, Saddam Hussein, worried now, scared that hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people would suddenly rise up against him. Saddam cracks down on the Dawa party, arresting and executing dozens. He leaves Bakr el Sadr at large. He's arrested him before, only to see the religious leader's status grow. The last thing he wants is to create a martyr. Bak is an ayatollah in his own right. In southern Iraq, at least 70% of which is Shia practically worship this ayatollah. So Saddam has to tread very carefully. What is he supposed to do with this man? How is he supposed to react to him? This man who has become now his mortal enemy. Facing rising threats inside his own country, Saddam strengthens his own personal security force, the Republican Guard, and fills it with loyal members of his family and hometown clan. Saddam Hussein never stayed in one place for very long. His personal security services uh, shuttled him around the country constantly for his own protection. Beyond close family, one of the few people Saddam trusts is Tariq Aziz, his deputy prime minister. Tariq Aziz is deputy leader of the country. He became Saddam Hussein's right-hand man, a man who was, incidentally, very well respected in the West. Being an Iraqi government official is very dangerous. If Saddam thinks that you could potentially threaten his rule, he'll have you immediately executed. On the other hand, many of these Ba'athist party officials have to worry about being attacked by the Dawa party, inspired by the Iranian revolution. Officials were being gunned down in the streets. Bombs were set off in marketplaces. Not only is Saddam's dream of retaking the disputed waterway and building a bigger Arab empire at risk, his own grip on power is at stake, a danger stoked by the radical Ayatollah next door and his allies inside Iraq. In early 1980, the Middle East is a tinderbox waiting for a spark. American hostages await their fate. Assassins and secret plots on both sides of the border could make the conflict explode. In early 1980, Ayatollah Khomeini and Saddam Hussein are both at each other's throats, carrying out a heated war of words across their shared border. Saddam calls the religious Ayatollah nothing more than the Shah dressed up in a turban, trying to label a religious leader as no better than the very dictator he overthrew. For his part, Khomeini calls Saddam an infidel, a godless tyrant, a man lacking any religion a strong insult against the ruler of an Islamic country, but it's more. It's a direct threat to his power. Both of these men were capable of extraordinary violence. Both had big egos, incredible determination and willpower, confidence, and a bitter dislike of one another. And all this came on top of the ongoing tensions between the two countries over their shared border, frustrations over who would be the dominant power, and who would end up having the most influence in the Middle East. Conflicts between nations can brew for years with heated accusations and threats flying back and forth. But there comes a tipping point that turns a war of words into something much more dangerous, the possibility of real war. A key event that sets everything in motion, a point of no return. With their backs against the wall, dictators generally see the path to outright war as their last best option, a possible solution to both internal and external problems. And sometimes those problems are one and the same. In March 1980, tension is high in the Middle East. Ayatollah Khomeini tightens his grip on power in Iran and lashes out at the world around him. America spent years helping build Iran's army, only to see it fall into the hands of a religious zealot, a dictator who now holds 52 Americans hostage. Despite four months of diplomatic and economic pressure, 
the Carter administration in Washington can't secure their release. At the same time, Khomeini continues to call for a religious revolution in neighboring Iraq, where Saddam Hussein faces rising protests and secret plots against his regime, many carried out by members of the Iraqi Dawah party, secret plots growing bolder by the week. April 1, 1980. Saddam Hussein's Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz heads to a local university in central Baghdad to make a speech at a large student conference. As Tariq Aziz enters the conference, several members of the Dawah party infiltrate the crowd. But rather than using a gun, which requires a line of sight, they prefer to use a bomb. Aziz enters, greeted by cheers. Then, an explosion. Several students lie dead. Aziz is wounded, but survives. For Saddam, it is the first direct attack at the very heart of his regime, an attack he blames not only on the Dawa party, but on Ayatollah Khomeini himself. The attempted assassination of Tariq Aziz really hit Saddam hard. Not because he was a personal friend or because Saddam had cared about his deputy prime minister, but because it was so close to him. He thought if this could happen to his closest associate, it could also happen to him. Something had to be done about the Dawa party. He passed legislation that not only outlawing the party, but that every member, as well as associate, was to be essentially liquidated. Well, in effect, Saddam was issuing his own fatwa. Hundreds of Dawa members are rounded up to meet a grisly end. The most prominent religious figure in the country, the man Saddam considers a mouthpiece of Ayatollah Khomeini, is also on the hit list. Reluctant to create a martyr, Saddam has spared Bakr el Sadr in the past, but now the man must be silenced once and for all. At this point, Saddam realized that he has no other option and he has to execute Bakr al Sadr. It's rumored that he had a spike driven through his eyeball and then in his death agony was lit a fire. The news of Ayatollah Bak's execution in Iraq became devastating news throughout the Islamic world. Khomeini in Iran didn't waver a single instant to denounce this treacherous act on the part of Saddam Hussein. In fact, he vowed that vengeance would be wrought on the Iraqi leader. For Saddam, there's no turning back. He next targets tens of thousands of Iraqis with family connections to Iran. I was in Iraq at that time, and everybody was very fearful because Shia of Iranian heritage were being seized by Secret Service officers from their houses, put in flatbed trucks, driven to remote border outposts. They were told to march into Iran with no possessions, and as a result, many of these people perished. Over the next few weeks, attacks and counterattacks continue. Anger boils on both sides of the border, reaching as far as Europe. June 4, 1980, two men enter the Iraqi embassy in Rome. Iraq had embassies all over the world, and they were targets. They were targeted by the Dawah militants and Iranian agents. When embassy guards arrive outside, the men shout, long live Khomeini, and execute one of the Iraqi staff. As they flee, they leave their briefcase behind. Inside, a time bomb, disarmed just moments before detonation. For Saddam Hussein, the ongoing attacks and the assassination attempt on his own deputy prime minister opens the door for an even bolder, more aggressive military gamble, a move that might save his regime and help realize his dreams. 
Some people think that the assassination attempt against Tariq Aziz was staged. Saddam always had had these ideas to become the great leader of the Arab world. This attack gave him the excuse to attack Iran, to overthrow Khomeini, who is calling for his ouster. But most importantly, to ultimately become the person who controls the entire Persian Gulf region. Saddam's growing army now numbers 200,000 men and 12 mechanized divisions. He has 2,700 tanks and nearly 200 Soviet MiGs. The morale of the army at the time was very high. They were well paid, they had excellent equipment, and in those special units, such as the Republican Guards, where they were comprised of tribal elements, the cohesion was very strong. Even so, attacking Iran could be devastating. Ayatollah Khomeini controls what remains of the Shah's powerful army, 150,000 soldiers strong. And the Iranian Air Force boasts American F-4 Phantoms and state-of-the-art F-14 Tomcats, built up over the years with help from the U.S. It is this powerful threat from the air that worries Saddam more than anything. Little does he know, the very Air Force he fears is developing its own secret plot. At a base inside Iran, officers gather and plan a military operation, a lightning strike that could change everything, and their numbers are growing. In both countries, potential enemies are everywhere. In mid-1980, Saddam Hussein is secretly preparing to invade Iran. He hopes to realize his own ambitions to build a greater Arab empire and also to stop Ayatollah Khomeini's attempts to promote revolution inside Iraq. With each passing week, the mortal threat to Saddam's power seems to grow. Terrorism inside Iraq spikes. Key leaders are targeted. An assassination attempt on Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz narrowly fails, but more than a dozen Iraqi officials are assassinated by suspected members of the Khomeini-supported Dawa party. And the harder Saddam clamps down on them, the more martyrs he creates and the more resentment he builds in his own population. This pushes Saddam to resort to more extreme measures. Multiple battle plans are often drawn up when a nation is preparing an invasion of another country, even though they're unsure of an exact timetable for action. Given Ayatollah Khomeini's attempts to undermine his regime, Saddam believes attacking Iran is now required. The decision is at hand. But when is the optimum moment to strike? A military action needs to seize on one of two things, the element of surprise or a moment of weakness. Saddam Hussein wants both. By July of 1980, tensions between Iran and Iraq are at an all-time high. With attacks on embassies and revolutionary unrest in both countries, escalation reaches the border with daily skirmishes on both sides. Locked in a fight for survival, Saddam Hussein launches a propaganda campaign, solidifying his cult of personality. His image is a great historical leader in peacetime and war. Cult of personality is to portray a man who is larger than life. In Saddam Hussein's case, it was to show him in billboards as an omnipotent, godlike figure. Always larger than life, always showing his greatness. Something that the Iraqi people could be proud of and identify with. Behind closed doors, his war plans solidify. Because of Iran's size and power, Saddam feels the last thing Ayatollah Khomeini expects is for him to carry out a full-scale attack. The heart of that attack will be the Shat al Arab waterway, which Saddam lost half of in the 1975 treaty he begrudgingly signed. To build his Arab empire, Saddam craves the oil-rich province of Khuzestan, historically part of Iraq. Unlike the rest of Iran, Khuzestan's population is mostly Arab. The people living in Khuzestan are not pure-blooded Iranians. They are actually Iranians of Arab origin. This is not lost in the Arab world in one way, shape, or form. 
Saddam Hussein, if he is going to invade this country and truncate it, he's going to appeal to the emotions of these ethnic Arabs and rename Khuzistan Arabistan. Not only would it allow him to come closer to his vision of becoming leader of the Arab world, but it would also enable him to enjoy the great reserves of oil, thus bankrupting Iran. But Saddam faces a huge problem, Iran's powerful air force. An air force with its own secret agenda, led by loyalists to the exiled Shah. It is planning a surprise attack on a target much closer to home. In July 1980, at the Nojay Air Force Base in Iran, officers upset with Ayatollah Khomeini's harsh religious rule plot to take power themselves. Their plan? Seize the Nojay Air Base, then launch direct strikes on the capital city of Tehran and Khomeini's personal residence. Once they kill Khomeini, they'll seize power, putting an end to the Islamic Revolution. The group is sworn to secrecy, but as their numbers grow, word leaks out. In the middle of the night, the day before the planned attack, news of the treason reaches two members of Khomeini's inner circle. The two excitedly go to Khomeini and wake him up and say, we have learned of a planned coup. It's going to happen tomorrow. They're going to bomb Tehran and a few other places. Uh, Khomeini very calmly says, we still have some time. Let's get them before they get us. Forces loyal to Khomeini and his revolution quickly move in on Nojay Air Base. They, they arrest virtually the entire officer class at this air base and put them under intense interrogation, torturing them and getting from them all the information of anybody who had anything to do with the plan. To ensure he crushes all disloyalty, Khomeini orders the execution of over a hundred high-ranking officers and throws several hundred more behind bars. Virtually the entire officer class who could fly any kind of plane was now either in prison or had already been executed. Many of them had nothing to do with the plans as it turned out. Khomeini treated the Iranian military like an occupier. He didn't dismantle it, he simply decapitated it. For Saddam Hussein, Khomeini's violent purge is an incredible turn of events. The Nojay coup attempt was very, very significant. Khomeini executes or imprisons virtually the entire Iranian Air Force. From Saddam Hussein's perspective, back in neighboring Iraq, this clearly plays into his hands. Without Iranian air cover, it's going to be much easier for the Iraqi army to invade Iran. On September 17, 1980, Saddam appears on Iraqi TV, announcing his justifications for war. He blames Iran for violating Iraqi sovereignty, for supporting a religious uprising against it, for backing an assassination attempt against his deputy prime minister, for attacks on Iraq property and territory. In a symbolic act, he tears up the despised treaty that forced him to give Iran half of the Shat al-Arab waterway. After years of waiting, Saddam feels it's now or never. I think the fact that Iran was increasingly isolated internationally, and the fact that the military had been purged of its leadership, that the Air Force had been decapitated, the fact that, the fact that there were a couple of civil wars going on in Iran at the time, and finally the fact that Khomeini kept inciting Shiites inside Iraq, all worked to embolden Saddam Hussein to attack. Across the border, Khomeini seems to believe that Iraq is far too weak to try a full-scale invasion. Khomeini lived in his own imaginary world. He was completely oblivious to the, the lurking danger from Iraq. He believed because he was popular inside Iran, Saddam Hussein would never dare attack. This is the day Saddam has talked about, ruling over a bigger, greater, and richer Arab empire is finally within reach. But war, as many learn the hard way, is unpredictable, especially against soldiers who believe God is on their side.
Will an invasion of Iran give Saddam what he so badly wants, or will it prove to be his biggest miscalculation? Saddam wants a quick, decisive victory. He also hopes, given the ongoing tension between Iran and the United States, that the United States may throw its support behind his invasion. In many ways, Iran seems unprepared for war. After a year and a half in power, Khomeini is still suppressing revolts against his rule. He lacks military experience, but he has an ideological zeal that Saddam cannot match and a potent secret weapon. In Iran, a new kind of army has been growing alongside the old. New militias loyal to Khomeini's Islamic revolution. Unlike the regular army inherited from the Shah, this is an army made up of those willing to fight, not just war, but holy war. The combination of nationalism and religion can power an incredible force. Winning a war against this type of force is far more difficult than comparing weapons and formations would suggest. Success in individual battles may be easy to come by, but winning the war is a completely different matter altogether. September 22, 1980. Saddam Hussein unleashes his military might on the Islamic regime of Ayatollah Khomeini. Iraqi MiG fighters penetrate Iranian airspace, attacking several key air bases. Khomeini has executed or imprisoned most of his pilots. Saddam believes the once powerful Iranian Air Force will put up little to no resistance. The strikes damage many runways, but Iranian planes are well protected in hardened concrete hangars. Most aircraft survive the onslaught and soon find pilots to get them off the ground. Khomeini calls on the very men he has imprisoned to defend their homeland. National pride proves more powerful than a grudge against Khomeini's harsh justice. These people are taken out of prisons, put in cockpits, and they join the fight and they continue fighting for a regime they despise, for a regime that has just killed half of their cadres. I think it will go down in history as one of the most patriotic moments of the Iranian Air Force. The liberated pilots retaliate with airstrikes on Baghdad and three Iraqi Air Force bases. At the same time, Iraq's ground forces push into the coveted province of Khuzestan. As Saddam planned, his army easily advances almost 80 kilometers into the mostly Arab region. But his surge hits an unexpected wall of fierce resistance at the city of Karamshar. What was Saddam Hussein expecting? He expected these Iranians of Khuzistan, Arabistan, to rise up against the Ayatollah and support him, Saddam Hussein. But they didn't do that. They fought him off. And there were many reasons why they didn't do that. They were Shia as opposed to Sunni. They were Persians as opposed to Arabs. The battle was deadly, murderous house-to-house -house combat, street battles, close combat. They called it the city of blood. On November 10th, 1980, Karamshar falls to Iraq. But by winter, Saddam's initial offensive has stalled without delivering the decisive knockout blow he had hoped for. Saddam's troops face more reinforcements many religiously motivated and inspired by Khomeini's revolution, a new Iranian militia known as the Besiege. The Besiege were recruited in the towns and villages across Iran. They were a new kind of zealot religious soldier that might eventually be used to open up the front against Saddam. I think Saddam Hussein grossly underestimated the Iranian people's willingness to fight for the country. He also grossly underestimated the willingness of Khomeini to send thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, to danger and, uh, in order to save his regime. Later on in the war, the Iraqis faced you know, masses of human uh, wave attacks. Um, most of which were just, you know, these were just Iranian teenagers uh, armed with the Quran, uh, you know, charging over minefields. 
The besieged, they wore little pendants with keys attached to them that supposedly would open up the gates to heaven. And these youngsters, the besieged who wore them, would run across these minefields, blowing themselves up like martyrs and sacrifice themselves. Saddam's desire to bring down Ayatollah Khomeini and building his own Arab empire fades. All that is left is a bitter and seemingly endless war along the border, with casualties growing on both sides. As I traveled throughout Baghdad and in rural areas as well, I was struck by how many buildings had a large black banner indicating a member of the family had been martyred, had been killed. And Iraqis began to express to me their concern. Is this war going to ever end? And they asked themselves, where is Saddam taking us? In early 1981, Ayatollah Khomeini releases the American hostages, perhaps in an attempt to limit his enemies on the world stage and focus his efforts on the war. But a relationship with the West has been poisoned for years to come, and with Iraq, a bitter and seemingly endless battle along the border, a battle doomed to become the longest conventional war of the 20th century. As the war dragged on and the deaths piled up in a personal battle between two ruthless dictators, Henry Kissinger would say, it's a shame both sides can't lose. Even so, the United States would end up providing support to Iraq during the conflict, not out of any love of Saddam, but rather out of a deeper concern of Ayatollah Khomeini. In international politics, you sometimes end up forming what people call unholy alliances. Alliances with those who don't exactly share your values or aims, but can help you realize a greater goal, to aid the lesser of two evils. One must calculate that the end result justifies some level of engagement. In this case, both Iran and Iraq would lose the war, but it wasn't Khomeini or Saddam paying the price. The estimated million lives lost on both sides, pawns in the hands of egomaniacal leaders are the true victims. And whatever support the United States provided has raised decades of questions and regret.